Hello and welcome back. My name is Clayton Allen and I'm glad you are continuing on this journey of Bible study and um, learning more Bible study methods. And if you watch my last video, I said I was going to introduce what I call the hermeneutical circle. And if you've been in church uh, any amount of time, you've probably never heard of the hermeneutical circle and that's okay. It's simply a name of the methods that I use to uh, slow myself down when I'm reading scripture to be able to study smaller passages at a deeper level. Now, one of the problems with study is that um, we are reading a book that is uh, 2,000 years old or up to 3,000 years old when you go all the way back to the earliest books of the Old Testament. And the Bible is a book that was written obviously in a different age and within and among different cultures. And both of those factors can create uh, major stumbling blocks and hurdles to proper understanding and then application of not only what the Bible is teaching, but also uh, what God wants us to apply to our own lives based upon that. So I'm going to share my screen so you don't have to look at me so much. And I'm going to give you some, some charts to look at. And uh, I want to introduce that hermeneutical circle in just a minute. But before I do that, I'm going to kind of highlight that idea of the different lenses that we have to look through culturally before we can even uh, look at the Bible in its purest form to understand it as it was written in its culture. Uh, because the Bible is a book that was written in history. So there are historical factors at work as well as the cultural factors and the more of those that we understand and are aware of, the better we're going to understand um, the stories and the context of uh, what we're reading in Scripture. So I'm going to share my screen. All right, this little chart here gives a good graphic illustration of what I'm talking about. We are here in 21st century Christianity. And um, so each of these uh, parallelograms, you can think of them as lenses or pieces of glass. And what we are forced to do when we read scripture, which is the screen box down here, um, we are looking through a whole range of lenses. The Bible story itself, um, you have 66 books, and so you have a whole range of time periods and a whole range of cultures and characters that show up in the Bible story. When we read that, um, we've all done this ourselves and we see it in other places, but oftentimes what happens is, is the modern our audience wants to interpret scripture through its modern lens. We want to read the Bible as if the, the stories um, happened uh, in our own cultural context, but that would be uh, grossly misleading to do that. Um, so that's uh, a dangerous fallacy that you want to avoid, is to try to read your own circumstance into scripture uh, right off the bat. Now, ultimately, when we're interpreting, we do want to uh, see how it applies to our modern cultural and uh, life circumstances, but we do not want to necessarily read those into what we would call the original meaning uh, of the scriptures. Now, uh, you might be a Baptist, you might be a Roman Catholic, you might be a Pentecostal, a Wesleyan, or uh, a Methodist, you could be a Presbyterian, you might be Eastern Orthodox, you might be an atheist. Um, any of those, we all have a tradition, whether it be a denominational tradition, a non-denominational tradition, um, a, a secular tradition, um, but we all have a tradition that we also have uh, that uh, frames how we interpret scripture. A, a Reformed Presbyterian is going to uh, think of salvation, the work of salvation in different uh, 
terminology or in, in maybe a slightly different way than a Wesleyan Methodist or Roman Catholic. So from the time of the church fathers, and the church fathers would, would be considered um, post-apostolic church leaders up through the time of, of say, Augustine, which was who lived around the turn of the uh, early 400s. So that first uh, two to 300 years of, of church history, after the original uh, books of the New Testament were composed, uh, those church fathers were writing a lot and trying to make sense of, of who Jesus was and um, understanding the scriptures and make them relevant in their current circumstances. Um, and then right on through the Middle Ages, um, men like uh, Thomas Aquinas, Anselm, uh, uh, men like that also wrote extensively and, and contributed greatly to theology and uh, uh, the understanding of, of scripture and their interpretations. And then you come through the Reformation period with men like John Calvin, uh, Martin Luther, uh, and then John Wesley, the Puritans, uh, the Baptists, and you have a whole line of tradition uh, coming up from the mid 1500s uh, through the through the 1900s, uh, Pentecostalism around the turn of the 20th century. All of those produce a traditional understanding and reading and interpretation of scripture. Uh, it's not necessarily bad, it just is what it is. We all look through a tradition lens. Now, even the biblical authors, let's take Mark for example. Uh, it was believed that Mark was Peter's assistant, so Mark's gospel is uh, largely considered to be an account of, uh, of the Apostle Peter. So Mark is recording Peter's, uh, much of his memories and his sermons and um, things that he taught about Jesus. And uh, Mark was likely writing to a Gentile original audience whether they were Romans uh, or Greeks, um, not entirely certain. But what we see there is the biblical author, in this case, we're talking about Mark, uh, the earliest uh, arguments for Mark's gospel being written, the first time put on paper would be the mid fifties, which would be about 20 to 25 years, maybe 30 years after Jesus had, um, uh, walked the earth and resurrected uh, in his uh, resurrected body. Uh, so that 30 years, now you have a, even by then, a different culture. Uh, Jesus uh, lived, it's believed, his entire life, other than maybe his early years, of course, in Egypt. But basically, Jesus was a, a Jewish man living in Palestine. And so his culture was, was uh, Hebrew, Palestinian. Uh, living under uh, a Roman-imposed uh, government. Um, well, if Mark is writing to, say, Roman Christians or Gentile Christians, uh, they have a different cultural context even than uh, the characters that Mark is writing about in his Gospel of Jesus Christ. So Mark has cultural factors that he's dealing with, and also his original audience, those first people that read Mark's gospel. They are looking through a lens when they read his book about Jesus who lived in Palestine. So it's very important to understand that there are lenses that we're looking through. And um, the poorer the teaching of a tradition, the more it's going to cloud the understanding. Thus, interpretation becomes very important. If you're looking through muddy waters, uh, the truth of Scripture is going to be hard to find. Uh, not to say that the Holy Spirit can't break through that. Obviously, uh, if you're re a Reformed Christian, you believe that uh, uh, the gospel became clear to men like Martin Luther and uh, John Calvin. And, um, but still, they were studying the Word of God 
very carefully. They were doing a close reading of uh, scripture, specifically books like Romans, and getting um, uh, a very clear understanding of the gospel of the gospel itself. Uh, another lens that's given to us is that eternal perspective of heaven. Books like Revelation are written. That's apocalyptic literature, and uh, it's showing what's happening on Earth from heaven's viewpoint. Revelation is the revelation of the resurrected and ascended Jesus Christ. Uh, he's telling us what's going on in the world from his perspective and uh, what to look forward to. And then on the other end, you have, especially in the Old Testament, you have a forward-looking view uh, from the prophets. And so <clears throat> uh, when you get, a say, a New Testament book, what's going on in the New Testament storyline um, has been predicated upon what the prophets foretold, as well as historical precedents. Israel's true exodus from Egypt um, shapes the rest of the story. And in fact, what we are doing today has been shaped by everything leading up to it. And it's all viewed from eternity, from God's perspective. <clears throat> so when we're doing careful Bible reading, one of the goals is to clean up our lenses. We don't want to study scripture looking through muddy waters. So how do we do that? That is where a study method becomes very important. So just briefly here, and in our next video, we will look at it in more detail, but I call them phases. The hermeneutical circle uh, is presented here before you. Hermeneutics, let's define the terms. Hermeneutics would be just defined as the art of interpretation. It's considered an art because uh, the more you do it, the more you practice, the better you get. It's not a science. It's interpreting scripture isn't like following a cookbook. Uh, it takes a lot of survey reading. You have to know the big story. Scripture interprets scripture. And the more of the big story of the Bible that you're aware of, the better you will be able to put the pieces together. We call it a circle or a spiral because as you're working through each phase, and that's generally the first phase that you start with, um, you are closing in on what I would describe as the essential meaning or meanings of the text. You spiral in after each phase. Now, we call it the center here. Notice that it's a circle. It's not a dot. When you're looking at a, uh, a short paragraph um, of scripture, there can be multiple meanings. Okay. There is obviously the core or the most central meaning of the passage, but there can be peripheral ideas being expressed. Uh, maybe less important, but true nonetheless. So we don't want to discount those. So we don't necessarily think of interpretation as a dot, that you just keep studying and keep studying until you find that one thing that the author is trying to get across. There can be a whole range of meanings in any passage. That does not mean that you accept false claims or false interpretations. It just means that there are, that the author is saying more than one thing. That's why when you read through scripture multiple times, and you read through the same passage a second, third, or fourth, or fifth time, you gain new insight uh, because the Bible is written on many, many levels. And so that's why we love to dig deep. All right, so just quickly before we end this video, we start with grammar or syntax analysis. The Bible is a book. Uh, it's God spoke to us through language, and so we want to understand that language as best we can.
but also the Bible is literature. It's great literature. So we do literary analysis. We look at the metaphors. We look at the genre. We look at uh, comparisons, contrast, poetry, um, all the different literary tools, the rhetorical arguments that the authors use, and there are many, many of them. And understanding those different devices being used gives us clues as to what the author wants us to gain. Anytime there's a quotation or an allusion to any other part of scripture, you want to go look that up because if the author is highlighting a different portion of scripture, whether it's a New Testament writer referencing the Old Testament or perhaps a late Old Testament writer, say Isaiah, who's going back to Genesis or Exodus or Deuteronomy, uh, it's important to go look at that because they will be related. Um, Oftentimes, the meaning of things that happen early, say what happened in the garden with Adam and Eve and the serpent, the, the long-term ramifications might grow. And so scripture, which again is given to us throughout history, uh, the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden continues to have greater and greater ramifications. And so say when, when Paul is talking about Christ being the new Adam, then perhaps he's setting a new precedent. But when he references Adam, you want to go back and look at that. Well, what happened because of the first Adam? Go back to Genesis. What did later authors say? What did the psalmist say about the sin of Adam? What did Isaiah or Jeremiah say about it? And then that'll help us understand the new Adam. Another very important feature are the cultural influences. Here is probably one of the key places where outside resources become very, very useful. Uh, commentaries or books written to give us uh, the cultures. If you're reading Paul's letter to the Corinthians, you want to know about Corinth. What was the culture? What was it like? Um, where was it? What was going on there in the first century? All of those things are going to help you understand uh, what Paul is talking about and the issues he's addressing. You want to understand Palestine in the first century. What was it like for Jesus to live as a Jew uh, under Roman occupation? And then you want to do theological analysis, whether it's biblical theology. In other words, what are in your passage that you're studying what are some biblical themes that are showing up that throw, that show up throughout scripture, as well as the big theological categories that systematic theology deals with, uh, whether it be uh, Christology, in other words, the nature of Christ, uh, salvation, uh, the character attributes of God, uh, sin, uh, end times, that would be theological analysis. And again, a, a problem most people they read a passage of scripture once or twice, and they skip all the other steps, and they go right to theological analysis, and they haven't done steps one, two, three, or four. And a lot of times you can come up with bad theology um, and misquoting, misinterpreting your text because you've maybe missed uh, the, the point that the author was making for his original audience. But then, of course, at the end, you don't want to leave a passage without applying it to your modern context. Now that I know what Mark meant when he wrote it with his original audience in mind, I can take that meaning or meanings and apply them to my context. Take the eternal truths and apply them to your situation. So I try and look at um, those six things at least, and it's not every tool, it's not every um, device that can be used to study scripture. There are lots of great Bible study methods, um, but those are the phases that I tend to wanna to work through when I am doing an in-depth Bible study. So before I 
stop this video. I'm going to stop sharing and put the screen back on me. So the, t the purpose of what I'm doing here is not to lead you through individual Bible studies. I'm not going to lead you through a study of Mark's gospel. I'm not going to lead you through a study of 1 Peter. I'm going to give you the tools so that you can go to 1 Peter on your own and do your own study. In essence, you become your own commentator. And when you're done with your study, if you choose to do so, you, you choose to do a close reading, by the time you're done, you're going to have your own book. Um, and again, you can do this in your head. You can do the cross-referencing, um, do the cultural analysis, the grammar and syntax analysis, and just store it in your head and in your heart, which is great. Or you can write it down as you go, which would, I think, be most beneficial, especially if you're a teacher. Um, but if you go to the bookstore and buy Bible study books, 99% um, of the time, um, the author of that book is employing the devices that I've just shown you from something like their own her hermeneutical circle. They're not telling you how they know what questions to ask. They're just asking you the questions. What I'm doing is showing you um, how to figure out how to ask the right questions. Because again, uh, hermeneutics is an art. Interpretation is an art. It's a process, it's, it's academic, but while you're doing that academic work, the Holy Spirit is working through his word and uh, shaping and changing your heart. So join me again on the next video and we'll begin to dig into grammar and syntax analysis.